This is the Idea Time Show with Dr. Joe North, helping facilitators expand their creativity, confidence, and impact through the power of innovation in action. Gain confidence as a facilitator, confidence with the technology, and confidence with your content and event design. Tune in every week for practical tips, strategies, and interviews that will accelerate your personal and business success. And now, here's your host, Dr. Joe North. Paul Slater from The Change Shed is today's podcast guest. Paul's an expert on change, culture, and transformation. And today we focus on how to build an innovative culture in your organization. We talk about what an innovative culture is, what it means in practice. We talk about what it means for leaders. And also we we speculate on the future of AI and its interaction with employee creativity. So a really interesting show. Hope you enjoy it. Look forward to hearing what you think. Paul, it's great to welcome you back to the podcast. Good to have you back. So for those people who haven't met you before, could you give a bit of an introduction to yourself? Hi, Joe. It's uh, great to be back on the podcast. Really delighted to be here today. So yeah, Paul, Paul Slater from The Change Shed. I help companies to innovate, change and grow so they can become more enjoyable, more valuable and more future-proof. So what sort of things do you get involved in? What are you working on? What's going on? So three streams probably to my to my work, Joe. So I do some corporate change and innovation work with large, complex global organisations. I also work here in the UK on one of the national programmes, which is about helping SME businesses to innovate, change and grow and to you know build their plans for the future and to create sustainable growth plans for those organisations. And additional to that, I have my own clients, which are either coaching clients or consultancy clients, variety of projects ranging from culture with an archaeology charity right now, through to working with an AI company on building their value before they exit. Fantastic. Oh, AI, very topical right now. Mm, we'll, absolutely. We might touch on chat GPT and, and all that jazz a little Love bit it. later. Yeah. We'll see. We'll yeah. see. Um, so why do you do what you do? I think um, my sort of interest for consultancy really was born when I was at university. I studied psychology and in my final year, I managed to network to a small consultancy business working in the local brewery in Yorkshire in the UK. And they were engaged in um, restructuring the teams of that organisation using a tool called Belbin. And I got involved in the project on a voluntary basis, getting great work experience and I realized actually helping out that small consultancy that I really liked this work. I enjoyed helping people. I loved helping to structure processes so that people could um, get better ideas and actually make them happen. So I got interested in consultancy in 1995 and joined one of the big consultancies out of university. And I've had a career, I guess, in and around consultancy and one or two other little diversions since then. Oh, brilliant. So it's it's interesting, isn't it, how we get to where we are. And, and today is all about building an innovative culture in mm-hmm. organisations. And I know that's something you're really strong and experienced in. And let's start off by exploring why do organisations need or why should they even bother thinking about an innovative culture in the first place? So what is it and why bother? Well, Two reasons, I think. Firstly, and, you know, I'm twisting a saying here to get to this, but innovate or die, right, in the the modern world and the change that we're all under. But I think why a culture of innovation? Well, it's so easy for innovation to fall on infertile ground and to not actually grow roots and, and actually take place. You know, unless we can encourage a culture of experimentation, a culture that allows people to take risks and learn. If we don't do that, then we're unlikely to get innovation in organisations. Yeah, I think you're right. The importance of innovation is absolutely huge. Um, Customers' needs are always changing, aren't they? And, um, you know, because the world's always changing and therefore organizations need to change they as you, you rightly say innovate Definitely. or die i say disrupt yeah. or, or be disrupted 
and yeah. I think that's that's really important. So, um, I yeah. Sometimes think, oh, sorry, Joe. I, son, I sometimes think about um, a kind of conveyor belt of commoditization, as I call it. So any sort of product or service that seems cutting edge at one time. If you think about consultancy, um, you think about Lean and Six Sigma and total quality management in the 80s, and then you think about digital and the birth of the first dot-com boom and bust you know, into the 90s. All of these things at one time were cutting edge, but they're on a conveyor belt that's slowly moving along towards something being much more commoditized and much less innovative as more and more people mm-hmm. get on board and get behind and start doing you know, some of the similar things. Yeah, it's right. I mean, I can remember when, um, you know, the iPad first came out, we're all over chat GPT. And, and, and actually being first out there, uh, you know, people are able to catch up quicker, so it seems. So we've got chat GPT out there, Google have, have brought Bard out um, even faster than they might have done otherwise. Mm-hmm. And, you know, even uh, with tools that you and I use when we're developing innovation culture and facilitating innovation sessions with organizations uh, to get those light bulb moments we you know Miro the, the virtual whiteboard tool has now mm. got an AI um, integration that even turns questions into code um, yeah. it's just incredible isn't it it is, it is. and then you, you know I'm a little bit of a geek and I you know I absolutely love playing with these tools but playing with them with a purpose you know really to try and bring them to my clients my coaching my consultancy to improve the engagement process to get to benefits more quickly, which I think is increasingly one of those changing customer demands that you talked about earlier. You know, expectations are getting higher and higher for us in the world that we operate in, but also for our clients and in servicing their their customers. So we've just got to constantly keep pushing and trying to stay somewhere close to, to the leading edge if we can. Yeah, definitely. So how would you define the term innovative culture like what is it well clearly i think there's two parts to that so there's the innovation piece which is about making new potentially novel certainly valuable changes and i think those changes exist on a scale you know from perhaps more incremental or adaptive we might say in terms of their innovation through to those really seismic game changing uh, you know, big hitting changes that can happen in innovation, big disruption, big disruptive changes. Mm. So that if that's the innovation side of the coin, what's the culture side of the coin? My, my favorite definition for culture and, um, you know, take a moment to, to, to say sort of God rest his soul, Edgar Schein, who sadly passed away recently, you know, great writer and thinker in the space of organizational culture. He described it as the way we do things around here. So if we take those, you know, those two things and put them together, how can we, in the way we do things around here, create an environment that is fertile for ideas and experimentation to build, test and learn and to make those changes on that scale from adaptation through to step change at the other end? Yeah, I mean, it's for me, it's also about um, tapping into that employee creativity and, and building the intellectual capital that the organization has Absolutely. to make it stand out, make it you know competitive, differentiate all of those things. It's the whole sort of innovation ecosystem, isn't it, Joe? Because you know it's not just the human capital and do people have um, you know the skills to apply those sort of creative techniques? Um, is the scaffolding there in the organization in terms of the resources, the time and space to allow people to learn from experiments, to test things out and to see, you know, what it is that really gets traction with their market, with their customers and so on. So it's getting that whole sort of system right in order to enable innovation to live and breathe, I think. And there's um, leadership capability to consider in all of that. I think, there's one thing leading a steady state organization where you're maintaining the status quo and keeping things going. I mean, that's, Mm -hmm. that's a challenge in itself, but leading an organization that's got to keep changing, evolving, keeping people engaged. um, It, you know, that the senior management uh, responsibility for innovation and, and making sure that those leadership structures are in place and working well with internal communications and connecting in, um, that's really important as well, and that you know, it, it's about leaders getting equipped to do that, isn't it? 
definitely. It is, it's about them being equipped. And I think, you know, in terms of innovation culture, it's also about how they model, you know. So do they walk the talk? Do they put their effort into, um, you know, enabling experimentation and learning? But it's also, I think, a lot about the questions that they ask. And I think this is really tied into culture quite heavily. Because when, for example, I worked with an organisation who said, look, we're all about innovating to meet our customer needs and developing our service offering to really meet our customer needs. It was interesting because when you listen to the questions that senior leaders were asking, mainly they were asking their colleagues about what's the marginal gain here? What's the financial business case for this? How much money is there in this? And they're important questions, don't get me wrong, you know, for a business mm-hmm. to be to health, healthy and, and survive and to meet its commitments. But that seemed to be just slightly out of line somehow with them saying, you know, we want this culture of customer first in terms of our product and service innovation. Yeah, and great leaders are also open to the answers as well and receptive to the answers because uh, by asking great questions and doing that in the right way, sometimes some of the the answers might make us feel, ouch, you know, oh, yeah. wasn't it? You know, that, that's a... Um, I think particularly when it comes from the multi-generational aspect that we have in organisations right Mm. now, different people with different, had a great conversation actually with, um, there were three generations having having a a coffee, a green tea in my case, in, in, in the Starbucks. And we were just saying how language is different for the same thing between those three generations. And we all, we we were all connected through the same project and the same organization. It was a great conversation. Yeah, absolutely. So being open, yeah. That that diversity just typically breeds, you know, better quality ideas, I think, because we're just testing things through different lenses and different angles. Mm. And if we're all exactly the same, then we'd be much more likely to come out with a very narrow um, set of ideas you know we, we often talk about diverge and then converge you know creative processes and then funneling in you you won't get that sort of divergence without that diversity uh, in, yeah. in the first place yeah and it's diversity across the whole spectrum of, of neurodiversity thinking styles background experience disciplinary expertise the whole you know multidisciplinary is 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 really important all all of the things so I think I think we've you know hopefully set the scene for Mm. what is um an innovative culture and it all sounds great so how on earth do we do we create this And, and I see um, you know, startups with some really funky approaches, and they can recruit mm-hmm. from scratch, and they, you know, you know, you can build something which aligns to a vision. It can be more challenging for a long-established organisation that hasn't been used to this level of innovative thinking mm. and you know, creative engagement. So, what for each of those, for both for a startup and then for an established organisation. What would the step-by-step processes be to building an innovative culture for leaders? Sure. Well, I think you already touched on one aspect in your introduction there. I think it's really important that we've got reasonable clarity around vision. You know, where are we going here? So, you know, if we're trying to put satellites in space, you know, you might expect our innovations typically to relate to those technologies and those applications of satellites in space and it's about that vision to be you know the premier um, launcher of of, uh, commercial satellites around the world so some alignment to the vision I think we have to create an environment where we have psychological safety so an environment where people don't feel like they're going to get thrown under the bus for making suggestions for coming up with ideas and for challenging and changing, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, so we've we've got to have that. I think that if you've got that psychological safety, I think that requires a degree of of trust, so that we can have some creative conflict in our organisation. So I think it's important to look at um, how do we manage those conversations that can feel a little bit edgy and uncomfortable, but do so in a way that actually the the, the conflict that's created in those, the tensions that are created in those, are incredibly productive. I think then, you know, so if that's a little bit about setting the scene, vision, psychological safety, establishing trust, we then probably need to have 
some process in place. So on occasion, I've worked with clients and we've talked about the idea of uh, an innovation pipeline. So how do we move from you know ideation and the fuzzy front end, coming up with great ideas to evaluating those, to thinking what sort of impact can they have for our business? What value do they have? Are they sustainable? Um, and then what steps and stages do things need to go through in our organization? Now that could be through really rapid build, test and learn cycles in a startup, for example. In a larger organization, you know, for really significant and disruptive innovations, that might be more of a gated process that we need to move through. And I think as we move things through that process, we need to recognize, communicate and celebrate that we're achieving these great innovations. You know, we're, we're changing things for our, for our customers, potentially even for the world. So I don't know if that gave you a series of steps, but certainly some of the ingredients yeah. in the recipe, shall we say. Yeah, definitely. And, and from, from my own um, doctoral research into innovation culture, um, I mean, it's a, it's a fascinating area. So um, innovative culture or, or how, how innovative a culture is, of course, depends on the perspective of the individual observing, processing, experiencing that culture. So uh, we could, you know, you and I could be in different, in the same organisation, in the same team and perceive the innovativeness of that team quite mm-hmm. differently based on our own preferences, which I think is is really interesting. But there are some some themes coming through in, in all sorts of um, research as well as my own, which mm-hmm. is that uh, dynamism and appropriate risk taking, as mm-hmm. well as time to make ideas happen, are three yeah. really important uh, areas for for organisations to take on board to create this perception that firstly we are an innovative culture, uh, and and secondly that that all you know that employees can can contribute. You can you can tap into that uh, employee creativity. Yeah, it's really interesting that you mentioned you know ap- appropriate levels of risk taking. I'm just interested. Maybe if, would you be happy to sort of expand on that a little bit, Joe? Yeah. So it's about giving things a go. It's the whole concept of how organizations deal well firstly interpret failure um, Mm -hmm. and how they deal with failure Um, how is it managed when that happens Mm -hmm. and and that connects in with your theme of that you were talking about around psychological safety you know Mm -hmm. we've got to be able to know that we can have a go give something a go and and if it doesn't go to plan we classify it as research and development uh, it, we classify it as learning rather than a failure. It's more information, it's data, so that we can, if we choose to do so, we can take that data, we can take that learning, and then go again. It's an investment in the next step, rather than I think people think you have an idea, and then you go and implement it, and you get it right the first time. That hardly ever happens in in yes. real life, and to expect that you're going to get there. You know, you've got to do your first crap version <laughs> of something, you know, that's ju- just good enough and then improve and improve and improve. Um, so, so that's sort of where I'm coming from, from risk and and dynamism and being able to move with it. And, you know, rather than I was talking to, to somebody else um, around innovation and, and she was saying it just takes so blooming long to make simple decisions to try small things that will cost us nothing do no damage but we just how do we get how do i get these leaders to move forward on things and i think um you know a big part of that and this is probably coming back to classic change management you know what's in it for them what's in it for the business but what's in it for them personally how does it help their agenda how does it help them to achieve their objectives in the organization and that could be a balance yes of typical business objectives you know greater revenue increased market share etc but for the individual are they looking for legacy you know are they looking to be that person that makes their team's life easier do they want to change the world you know Mm -hmm. um i don't know if i'm allowed to name brands but you know you think about i'm going to um i don't work for them by the way but you know patagonia and and everything i love patagonia you know so they're they really are, you know, if you think about that sort of Bain value pyramid, pushing right up in towards the top of the pyramid, you know, being life changing and, and helping people to um, do the right and greener thing, I suppose. And yeah. 
giving away a lot of their profit to uh, worthy causes as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Patagonia are great in terms of, uh, I think they've given the, the business back to the planet. Um, really clear value proposition in terms of, look, don't buy stuff you don't need. Don't throw stuff away before you've tried to mend it. Um, we'll try and make great stuff with the whole life cycle in mind. Um, and you as the customer, your end of the deal is that you try and look after it, you bring it back to us to mend it, you know, and and that we between us we don't waste things, that we look after the place we're in. Uh, and um, I think, you know, one of their values is actually around activism. And, and it's because they're bold and because they're standing out and because they're different and putting their head above the parapet a little bit, that is what's really contributing hugely to their success, isn't it? Absolutely, um, you know, their their tribe just aligns to their values so very, very clearly. Um, internally and externally. So, yes, so that goes yeah. through to innovative culture inside as well and what you were saying about yeah. vision in the... Oh, absolutely. Yeah, if everybody's on the same mission, the same journey, um, then, then it, it really helps, doesn't it? Yeah. So um, with with innovative culture, I think a lot of people think, well, well a few things actually have popped up that, that, have, that have been prompted in my mind because, you know, from the things that you've said. Mm-hmm. So um, one of those things is that sometimes people talk innovation and say they want it, but they don't really, they like the idea of it. But not the mm. risk or the work. Yeah. How how often have you bumped into an organization and somewhere in their values they've got innovation? And then then actually, if you pick under the surface a little bit, it isn't happening for some reason. Mm. And I suspect a lot of the time that's going to be a cultural barrier. So it's something about the way in which we behave and the behaviors that we accept. So do we enable um, try out and collaboration and you know innovation labs and space to to make things uh, to make things work differently and better mm. or, or do we do we do we suppress that maybe not even intentionally but we have a process that is so bureaucratic and heavy to move an innovation forward that people just go do you know what I'm I'm 120 percent busy already two years by the time yeah yeah and, yeah. and it's just like deep sigh and the shrug of the shoulders and and they're defeated and all of a sudden you know that innovation isn't going to happen because of these sorts of factors yeah I, I think that's um that's right and one of the biggest barriers from the surveys that I've done but also um from the people that I've worked with the businesses that are aiming to innovate and really mm. want to you know really want to really want to make a difference and have have an innovative culture is they say it's time. And I don't know if time's a real reason or not. Time, Time's always constrained. It's always the thing in, you know, work grows to fill the available time, doesn't it? Um, yeah. With innovation processes that, you know, listeners to this podcast will be very familiar with, you know, using innovation sprints and design thinking, for example. You know, you can achieve an awful lot in a relatively short space of time, provided that, you know, you're prepared to set things going in the right direction and not let perfection get over, you know, to stop progress, essentially. Yeah, I, th- I think um, that's one of the biggest challenges is this perception that we don't have time. So um, how how can organisations get a cultural change so that innovative culture is just it, an innovation It's in the DNA of the businesses because I think the, the problem that some organizations have is that they see innovation as something that's separate and something they do on top of mm-hmm. the day job rather yeah. than seeing innovation as being within the you know embedded within the day job absolutely I think there's a number of concepts in business and organizations that fall into that camp so you know quality used to be the job of the quality function, the quality department. I think businesses increasingly are recognising quality is everyone's challenge, you know, to in their internal processes and their customer-facing ones and, you know, the product service that they deliver. I don't think there's one silver bullet here, but, for example, um, the, first, the first time, I think the first time that someone puts their head above the parapet and offers an idea, 
a change, you know, something that could become and blossom into an innovation, if they're encouraged and nurtured at that point, you know, they're a hundred percent more likely to continue to innovate. If at that point, you know, they get sort of cut off below the knees, it's stamped down, or in some way they're made to think, you know, that was a silly idea or a, or a silly challenge. You know, that for me is just a cultural cycle that will suppress innovation and it will never be able to grow at the heart of the culture of the organisation. Mm. So we allow things to breathe and we're curious, I think. We're curious to say, yeah, okay, that's interesting. What if? And, you know, and ask questions in a more appreciative inquiry style than, you know, perhaps just saying, um, you know, than, than, than using language that can close things down. So it's yeah. that sort of openness at the start. The first time we do things leading to things uh, perpetuating, celebrating our innovation, um, connecting people to the impact that it has. I think quite often, you know, people in a, you know, perhaps in a, you know, in a manufacturing environment, they might have a role which is around a number of components in something that becomes a much bigger product. How do we help them to see that what they're doing and perhaps how they innovate in their process can have really big impacts? How do we paint a picture of both the company's future, their role in it, and the impact that we have on our customers so that I can connect to that and see that what I do and what I innovate actually helps to achieve the vision and really helps our customers to to do great things as well. It's the old sort of NASA example that's often it quite is. said about, you know, yeah. the, the, the person um, helping to keep the place clean is, uh, keep NASA clean is helping put somebody on the moon, you know, that, so uh, it's, that, it's that line of sight, isn't it, all, all the way through? Yeah. It's, I mean, it's a very well-trodden um, story, isn't it, the NASA one? But, you know, I see it all the time in companies that are doing this well. So um manufacturing company making componentry for heavy utilities, turbines, um, you know, in, uh, in, in biomass generators, for example. So stuff going into big electricity utilities, but they're making some small components of that. But they've got the pictures of, you know, those big plants and, uh, you know the 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 exchanges and all of the things that effectively remind them that they're keeping the lights on here in in the UK. So it's enabling them to make that connection. Little things around um, cost and waste, for example. You know, I saw in one one organisation where they were trying to help people to understand. Look, if we waste this much product in our process because you know we haven't really been careful enough about right first time then that's going to be the equivalent of a nice pair of uh, Nike, and I'm sure there's other brands available, trainers. You know, and everyone can think of a number when they think about the trainers that they've perhaps bought for their you know, teenage kids or for themselves. You know, wasting this means you've just dropped £140, $160, $70, I guess, something along those lines. Yeah. Um, so it's visual cues and connections. Yeah, I think actually if, if uh, an organisation – wants to start to to build an innovative culture if if the leaders um are thinking you know maybe maybe some leaders listening to this or our managers listening to this are thinking you know we could really do with being a lot more innovative i feel like all the ideas come from me and you know whenever i ask for any ideas it's the same old same old mm. i think a really good place to start with that is um firstly around continuous improvement even learning from past mistakes mm um making those those small changes you know and getting people just starting learning to think uh differently is is a really good way in yeah. and i think you know it's all right saying well i want everybody to be more innovative come on be more innovative but what do you want them to be more innovative about and uh give them some specific themes like uh so for instance in in rail i asked um, all of our 6,000 uh, employees that we had all over the region to say, mm. all over the north to say, actually, people are, too many people are getting away without paying for their rail ticket, for their train ticket. Mm. And it's annoying the people who are paying for their train ticket. So you have this you know, direct view of what's going on out there. You know, you know, you see things and know things, you know things really well. What can we do differently uh, to, to reinforce that and get those people who aren't paying um, to to either get them to pay 
or to uh, to catch them so that they do pay in the future or they don't travel. And the number of ideas when you get asked for specific when you ask specific questions like that, the number and the quality of responses that you get back is, is so much better rather than just saying, let's be more innovative. Innovate. Let's innovate everybody. Yeah. 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 I, I totally agree. And I think, you know, as well as having those sort of themes or pushes or, um, you know, asking good questions, it's sometimes also about reframing the questions as well. Mm. Um so there's a there's a there's a lovely article in the the Harvard Business Review, and I think it's something along the lines of you know are we asking the right question? And it talks about the example you might have heard this one about an, an old but large apartment block. I think it's potentially New York, certainly somewhere in the states. Okay. And the residents of the apartment block are really quite upset because the the one lift in the centre is dead slow, and it takes forever to get around the building up and down, you know, back to their back to their apartment and so on. So they started asking the question, how do we make the lift go faster? And they just ran into a brick wall because essentially, you know, they couldn't get the machinery changed. They couldn't afford it. They couldn't get into the, you know, the old infrastructure to do that. So they said, well, how can we make, how can we ask a different question, essentially? And one of the questions that came out of that process, I believe, was, well, how can we make the weight a bit more palatable for people? So they put wall length mirrors down the sides of the lift on every floor Uh, the lift, the elevator on every floor. Uh, And they found that they just got less complaints because people being people just, you know, checked out their tie or their their, their hair or whatever it might be in the mirror and that made the weight just that little bit easier for them. Well, it's productive, isn't it? Yeah, they asked a different question and got to a different solution with that. So, you know, can we reframe the question um, and use ideas like, um, you know, Where is the problem happening? When is the problem happening? What is the magnitude of this? Who does it impact? Um, Can we ask the anti-question sometimes? So, you know, if we really wanted to screw this up completely, what are the three things that we would need to do really well to make everything really Mm. uh, fall apart and break apart? And then reverse that to try and get ideas on what we should do. So there's lots of great techniques around reframing and sort of restructuring the question, I think which yeah. you can embed in an innovation culture by using them, promoting them, you know, making them easy for people to access. Um, people have a day job. You know, they're not sort of constantly thinking about different tools and techniques like using a crazy eight or something else to innovate. But if we can educate and enable that through, you know, point of need, easy to find, and maybe having some champions and, and individuals who can help the innovation process mm-hmm. in organisations, then that's another thing that can just help anchor innovation in the culture, I think. Yeah, definitely. Um, and, and some of those examples there, I hadn't heard of the example of the elevator and the waiting time before, so that's a really good one. And um, it reminded me in a different way of an example I heard Steve Radar talk about at an event I ran. So he's the collaboration director for NASA, and he was talking about the problem of, um, of he, he, I was really impressed actually because uh, we, it was a UK event and mm-hmm. he used the word potato crisps instead of chips. Um, mm-hmm. So he was talking about um, potato crisps or chips, you know, when they've been fried and they're being dried off and they're really thin and fragile, you know, thin slices of potato cooked and crispy. And the process of removing excess oil, hmm. um, and and how that was done is is they're on um, they were put on vibrating plates to shake sort of shake the oil off. And of course, it's a fragile product, so mm-hmm. a lot of the product was getting broken and wasted. Yeah. And the um, so so the point Steve was making is that you know this isn't a context specific question. If you go out to the world, uh, which this which this food company did, if you go out to the world and say, "How do you um, do? How do you get this excess oil off a of potato crisp without breaking it?" It's very context specific. So what they did instead was they reframed the question of mm-hmm. how do you get um, an oil off um, off off a delicate um, you know material. Mm. With, with off a brittle material without without damaging it. I mean, they phrased, they phrased it better than that, and they put that out there. 
because they're thinking someone somewhere has solved this problem on something else and there might be something we can learn. Um, and the answer came from um, a violinist and the, um, the idea which they put into practice commercially and actually used was around using acoustics and sound to get rid of the excess oil without damaging the crisps. Now, I'm a crisp fan, so um, that's a really good story for me. But but it is about reframing that and looking, you know, having um, an innovative culture where people are looking outside mm -hmm. and including outside the sector they're in to see where these problems have been solved elsewhere. Absolutely, looking outside and... You know, potentially even looking at the natural world. You know, we know of all sorts of innovations, don't we, where people have looked at, mm. um, you know, termites and how they build their termite nests. I'm probably using the wrong word, forgive me, but, you know, that can lead to advances in material science and, and um, you know, looking at those sorts of processes. Mm. But what, one of my favourite tall tales, I'm sure it's a tall tale, is the one about, um, uh, you know, using grizzly bears to... Um, keep telecommunications live in Canada. You've, there were no might... no bears harmed in the making of no, this. No, bar, no bears harmed at all. Okay, good. Yeah. R really quick, I think the question was, um, you know, parts of Canada, very heavy snowfall, traditionally going back a few years, and, may, and, 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 and today I think to an extent, you know, we've got these overland telephone wires, um, heavy amounts of snow causing breakages potentially innovation session how can we fix this oh well lots of ideas Let, let's what about all the bears let's get the bears to shake the telegraph poles to get the snow to come down right so what seems like a really silly idea at first you know oh how do we get the bears to do it we'll put something on the poles to you know entice them well actually then by applying that thought process okay we need vibration so maybe we can overfly the uh, key lines that tend to break with a helicopter you know periodically after a heavy snowfall the acoustics the vibration bouncing the snow off the wire like the oil off the crisp or chip that's brilliant and it, it is isn't it it's about um you know because i think people see innovative culture about sitting in brainstorming ideas and having wild or mucky ideas that nobody will ever do anything with and, and sometimes it is about pushing those ideas and having fun with them and being playful in order to then bring it back to something that is purposeful and can be used. But unless we stretch it, we end up with the same old, same old, don't we? You know, so, so some of the best ideas, the great ideas are the ones that are pushed and become real light bulb moments. Yeah, exactly. It's, um, you know, there's a classic example I heard recently where the, the first question was, um, imagine we're trying to raise £100 for charity. Give me some ideas. You know, when people come up with great ideas like a cake sale or getting sponsored to do a walk or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then we make it in scale terms much, much bigger. And we say, right, well, how would we raise a million pounds for charity? And all of a sudden, the paradigm's completely shifted. So we're now talking about rock concerts um, and, you know, endorsement from celebrities and this kind of thing. So we've shifted the paradigm. So it's how we ask the question and how we stretch our thinking. So I'm a big fan of really being prepared to really, you know, go for that moonshot. And we know if we miss the moon, we're going to still land in the stars. Yeah, yeah, that's that's great. I think you're right. The, the questions we ask ourselves um, lead to, the, you know, the quality of the questions uh, influences the quality of the thinking and the size of the question and the ambition of the question influences the ambition of the thinking as well so uh mm. yeah and th these are really simple things that that people could start to do you know so um and, and start to do them better tomorrow you know later on immediately after li listening to to this podcast so they're, they're very simple tweaks aren't they but it's about being mindful uh i, I loved what you said mm. sorry I, I loved what you said about language as well and appreciative inquiry so appreciative inquiry for people who are listening to it who are new to it we've got a whole um, video and, and blog on that um, so the videos on the youtube channel the articles on the um, big bang partnership website uh, on the blog so you can just search appreciative inquiry it's inquiry with an eye um, it is all about building on the positive looking because 
our our efforts go where we focus most. So if we focus on positive and recreating the positive, we'll therefore um, get more positive outcomes because that's the direction we're pushing in. And the number of times I hear the word yes, or the words yes, but, yes, but, yes, but, when in an ideation session. And in fact, I was working with a, a, a team in, in Europe and I highlighted this to, to one of the senior managers in the team. Mm. And then every time he said yes, but for the rest of the day, it was almost like our our antennae were, were tuned into it. And there was one thing he was saying, and he must have yes butted about a dozen times in you know in a few minutes. It's yes but and yes but and yes. And it's about being really mindful of, of our language and conscious yes. of what we're saying. And the impact that has not just on the people that we're talking to, but how it can actually uh, connect and jar with, or jar with, depending on where we go, our own thinking and the way our own brain works. Because our brain responds to what we tell ourselves, right? It does. You know, and I think um, we can use language that opens and we can use language that closes. So I like how might we, because the word might opens up to possibilities uh, and opportunities. You know, how should we implies a value judgment. You know, is this the right thing to do? Mm -hmm. um, and all of a sudden that's that's closing down opportunities. And I think these are cultural issues, aren't they, Joe? Because it's, it's the way we do things around here. It's the way we talk around here. It's the way we um, feedback constructively, hopefully, to each other when we see people yes butting and closing down rather than yes anding and opening up yeah I mean I was able to do that because it's in a specific learning environment where that's what we were there to do was to um was to help build uh, a culture and lead a culture that, that is more innovative and more inclusive mm -hmm. and more in, you know engaging um to, to develop those ideas but you know, and I've just buttered then. So it's, it's you know, we all say it's, these things. We all do these things. I think I'm probably saying it because we're talking about it. It's um, very difficult. No, it's 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 so natural, isn't it? Um, yeah. But as you say, being mindful, being conscious, and perhaps not letting that sort of uh, uh, stop the progress that we can make when we're when we're sharing ideas. What are some of the biggest success stories that you have? directly been involved with in your consultancy practice i think that really depends on how you sort of judge success joe so you know in in my time i've been involved in perhaps some of the the biggest you know world firsts um a world first in terms of frontline culture change and training within a, a governmental department in the uk um, a world first in terms of digital within the nhs um, which, in fairness, wasn't exactly the success story I might be painting it to 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 be. So I won't name names, but people could probably work out if they're from the UK which uh, consultancy that was that was involving. Um, but in terms of stuff that I think I'm really kind of proud of right now, I've worked recently with a a charity. Um, they work in the the, the world of of, uh, of his, history and uh, you know historical preservation and, and the environment. And that work was really around establishing with them, you know, what are the behaviours that we want to see in our organisation as we move into the future. Um, part of that was certainly around innovation in terms of their member offer, which is, you know, something that charities are continuously having to think about. But really the focus was more on the sort of culture behaviour side, yeah. which led us into talking about how do we actually stitch culture and behaviour together with um, performance and how we support performance and how we support development in our organisations. And we allowed, I guess, that process to evolve um, and the feedback at the end, we just closed the project a couple of weeks back and the feedback was, you know, this has been transformational. It's so different and so much better to what we used to do yeah. uh, in the past. So that, that's one that, you know, I feel particularly proud of, yeah. That's fantastic. I'm, I'm sure there's loads that you could, because uh, you're very, very good at, at what you do. Um, I've got a, a quite, we, we mentioned chat GPT earlier. Mm. So how do you think AI is going to impact how organisations work 
And what does that mean for innovative culture? So I view it as a tool that augments humans. Um, and I think it's it has the possibility of enabling greater and faster innovation in organizations. Um, simple examples. So I guess there's places where we can sync our time that can now be accelerated by using AI, giving us more time and space to innovate. So, so what, what sort of things, what sort of things can AI help us do uh, to free us up to do other things What in, in the world of work? So one of my clients, for example, is selling their AI solution to asset managers so that asset managers can operate with precision at scale. What does that mean? Once upon a time, if they were managing, say, 50 assets, you know, 50 companies, and they were looking into the details and the risks around those companies, you know, that was really as much as they could manage. With AI looking at global sentiment, um, potential risk, and, you know, millions of key financials almost instantaneously, they can scale that to actually operate at a much higher level. So 500 companies, say, rather than 50. So they've 10 times, 10 x to use the trendy phrase, you know, their, their capability in terms of how much work they can do. So I just wonder if, particularly in service industries, for example, you know, we can 10x our output so we can serve more customers in a better way, but in a way that's still very much augmented by the AI and controlled yeah. by the human in that process. I think that's great. And what I would add to that is that on the way, it's important to ensure that the AI is uh is, is appropriate so I'm, I'm thinking about things like algorithmic bias and 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 that the ai is informing and making decisions or informing decisions on a way that is fair equitable uh, inclusive and so on i think because algorithms have got some sort of human you know humans start this stuff right yeah. and humans have we, we have all sorts of bias but even uh, I was talking to somebody whose daughter had had exam results in the COVID period and couldn't sit the exam. It was a, it was a, you know a, a proper exam, a, a public exam, and mm -hmm. and therefore the uh, algorithm had calculated what the final grade would be based on not just the previous work that the young person had done. Mm -hmm. um, and attendance and those sorts of things. So all those things were factored in. But things like the postcode and external factors that were outside of that individual. And that sort of, I can see that that is relevant. And I can also see that it's also potentially very unfair. Absolutely. So the AI learns from the rules that we plug into it. Yeah. Really. yeah. So, you know, we still have a, um, you know, a massive moral obligation to to do the right things there to be conscious of all of the potential cognitive biases that we have as humans and they you know the, the, there are many of them mm. hundreds i think potentially mm. um which can work in our favor but also you know can can also lead to some pretty poor decisions but I, what i what i do think is a statement of the very obvious ai is here to stay it's only going to become more prevalent more integrated into business processes as we move forward. We can either view it as, you know, a, a tool to help create better lives and better products and services for people. Um, or, or we can or we can view it as a threat to humanity, as you know, many famous writers and, and public figures have already started to alert us to. So, you know, I think we have to be really cautious here. Yeah. Uh, and beware the unintended consequences, hmm. particularly for small companies, small companies in a digital space. My, my belief um, is that unless they have ways to leverage AI and potentially even integrate AI into their product in the way that Miro, you mentioned, have done that, or Miro, um, I know some of the sort of objectives and key results management systems out there are now using AI to generate um, objectives and key results or KPIs. 
So we're seeing increasing application. And if you want to be future proof as a small business, particularly, I think then you've got to be integrated. Yeah. You've got to look at how you can integrate. Especially tech companies, tech companies that uh, aren't working with AI in some way or developing AI solutions, um, you know, certainly, certainly need to catch up. So, I mean, to be honest, AI has been with us for a very long time. Uh, it's inbuilt into so many things that, that we use. I think what ChatGPT has done is, is it's made it accessible so people can start to see what they can do with it rather than mm. being on the receiving end of um, the bank that makes the mortgage decision based on AI or uh, experiencing Facebook through what Facebook chooses to present or Google present choose to present to us through their AI and so on. Absolutely. Um, it, it's suddenly become available to all of us for free and we can see how we can use it i mean i you know it's i think you're right it's here to start and it's about taking those things um not resisting them integrating them into a culture of innovation um mm. creating an innovative corporate culture or innovative small business culture yeah. and uh and working with it but doing it in a conscious mindful yeah. way yeah it's asking another big question of businesses in the sense that they've, you know, they've had to tackle this question of um, social media and, you know, do we have policies and guidelines around what people do and don't say and how that reflects on our organisation? High profile case in the UK recently, of course, with a sports presenter making political comments through Twitter and, you know, that that, that sort of washing out into quite a debate, a national, yeah. a national debate, really. So I think organisations, like they have with social media and other technologies, are going to have to think, okay, so AI is here, it's accessible. When we leverage it, how do we leverage it? Um, do we need to, you know, reference that we've used chat GPT in, in these things? It's interesting. I think I saw on LinkedIn recently someone had written a sort of short story, but you know, in in quite a fun way, they'd used chat GPT to do it all. Yeah. You know, and they, they owned up to it and said, but, you know, actually it's a pretty good read. And Yeah, uh, I, I've, I, follow, I follow someone who helps authors get successful with their books and he'd, he'd got uh, an AI book cover that he'd designed and um, that, that he, not he hadn't designed, the AI had designed, you know. So um, there's also re there's some funny ones. There was, a, just as an, a, an aside, there was a great one where somebody had said he was really cheesed off and... Um, you know, wanted to send a note back to somebody at work, an email back to somebody at work who he was really sort of peed off with. Um, but how could he phrase it more appropriately? And um, and the and, and chat GPT was saying, I'm really sorry to hear that. <laughs> um, here's how you might want to phrase it and did an appropriately phrased email. So uh, so it's, it's interesting. Who knows where it will go? I'm sure it will just keep evolving at pace. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and... As organisations, everybody needs to be ready for that and think about how they can use it and do so in the right way. So, Paul, this has been absolutely amazing, as always. I mean, we could talk, I think we could talk for hours. Uh, where can people find you and connect with you? I'm, I'm sure listening in, there'll be people who want to sort of explore some of these themes a bit more with you. So yeah. where, where do you hang out? Um, well, Hugely excited to have conversations with with anyone who would like to follow up. Um, probably the easiest way to get hold of me, given time zone differences and everything else, is just via my email address. So that's uh, paul at thechangeshed.com. And I believe we'll put that into the podcast. We will. Note. All in the show notes will go. Yeah. Um, all Brilliant. the links. Website. Um, LinkedIn. Yeah. LinkedIn. Really great place to engage and would love to engage over linkedin and again that will be in in the uh, in the show notes and uh, you can even drop into my website check out a couple of the videos there's some health checks on there around change and having a future proof culture that you can uh, do for free and get some you know some sort of instant feedback that might be interesting and useful so I encourage you to contact me or, or or check out the website through one of those uh, three channels Paul, as always, it's been amazing talking to you and uh, some some really good food for thought 
and tips as well. So thank you very, very much indeed. Thanks for having me. Thank you for tuning in to the Idea Time Show, brought to you by Dr. Joe North. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and access more completely free resources at bigbangpartnership.co.uk forward slash resources. We'll see you next time.